Liz, so great to have you here uh, in front of this august crowd. And we're going to have a really interesting conversation, I think. And I think, as Mackenzie tends to do, it's going to tee us up uh, for the, the conversations to come tonight and tomorrow. And I want to start by asking you about the world we're living in right now before we get to questions of leadership, because it is it's a time of disruption, <laughs> to say the least, and I think economic disruption more than anything. So from where you sit, sort of set the table for us, because you are talking to CEOs all the time who I'm sure are facing some of the biggest challenges in their careers. Sure, I'd be happy to. Well, this certainly is an unbelievable crowd, and I'm sure every single person in this room has a point of view on that question. It is something that, uh, and McKinsey, we think a lot about, uh, McKinsey's quite a global firm, so we look at that question from many different perspectives. I mean, I think the first thing that's on all of our minds without question is just the scale of the shift in economic power to Asia and to the emerging markets in general. But, you know, the, the level of news and the level of uncertainty associated with the U.S. trade deal with China is certainly very front and center on, in our minds. If you think of 2.4 billion households that will join the middle class, in Asia and Africa, it's relatively hard not to focus on that as it's something that every single CEO should have on their minds. So that's one. I'm sure almost everyone in this room is, is seeking to take some advantage of technology disruption that's underway. And so, you know, whether that's AI, whether that's material science, whether that's what's happening in biotech, it's very much here and real. I think, you know, some of the things that uh, also give us a uh, question or pause is, is just aging, you know, the degree to which the um, developed economies are experiencing aging on a scale that we really haven't handled before and the kind of pressure that will put on many governments um, and maybe opportunities for folks in business. You know, and then, and then lastly is, is just a sense that um, there's a need for a new societal deal. We, we have published quite a lot about the topic of automation. We estimate somewhere between 100 million and 300 million people will either need to switch jobs or in some way be retrained. That's very material. You have 500 million people who are not likely to see uh, either improvement in their income, likely to see a decline in their income. So, you know, change is afoot, and it's the responsibility of every single person in this room to be conscious of what's happening and to, and to respond. All right, so we're gonna dig into to a lot of that, and I'm especially interested in this, in this notion of a societal shift. Before we get into some of the challenges of leadership, I, I wanna go back to something that, that struck me when you were talking about US-China trade and all of those things that you just laid out. Are the CEOs you talk to, are they, are they worried? Are they cautious? Like, How would you describe them if you can generalize? And obviously, you work across a lot of industries across North America, but like, what's their mood right now? Yeah, so I mean, I think I think the mood is mixed, and I certainly experience it, it varies by industry segment. So yeah. you'll have very many industry segments where folks say, you know, I know everyone's looking around the corner. I know everyone doesn't understand what's happening to the economy today. When will we enter a recession, or when will we enter a slowdown? But my business is just fine. You know, yeah. we're doing just fine. So so you do hear a fair amount of that. You do also hear, hear sectors where people are planning and where people are feeling like, uh, I need to be ahead of this. We did look pretty closely at the 2008 recession and looked at folks who were, you know, quote, winners and losers coming out of that. And the punchline, you know, not surprisingly, like my mother could have told you this, is you do need to prepare. You know, the person who is more prepared actually does better. The person who's in a more aggressive posture going into a downturn does better, and whether that's in terms of their capital position or their cost position or in terms of M&A, but it actually does matter that you're prepared. So, you know, I think your mother could probably have told you that too, yeah. but it does seem to be an actual fact. And do you feel like people are taking that to heart right now? Like, are people sort of- Planning. Planning yes. right now? We okay. absolutely see people planning. Now. And do you think that's driven mostly by the, the sort of trade crosswinds? Is it the fact that in you know a matter of days, we're going to be in the longest economic expansion we've been in historically. Like, what's sort of nagging them? I think both. I think yeah. both the sense of you know genuine uncertainty uh, in terms of the political context and an expectation that you have to prepare for yeah. any outcome. And so you see that you see all kinds of planning around supply chains. You just cannot avoid that reality. Right. And then you know similarly, you, you just can't you can't get past the factoids about 
the extent of this expansion. Right. And how much, and I want to get to leadership in a second, but, but I'm really interested in this, clearly. Um, when you when you think about supply chains especially, and you know, Carol, you and I have talked a lot about this on our show when we've you know, had CEOs in, we've had investors in, talking about these shifts in supply chain because when you, out, when, when you lay out, as you did, the, the market opportunity in Asia, you've got to prepare for that. But at the same time, you may have to shift your supply chain dramatically right now and that shift is going is, is gonna to take hold for, yeah, for a long we, time. In, in every sector, we see that happening already. Yeah. And, and obviously, that will lead to the growth of the rest of Asia without question. There's a colleague of mine um, on this whole topic of you know, the change in, in where economic value creation is in the world. A colleague of mine used to uh, tell a story where he would ask, often a group of European CEOs, you know, who runs Sweden for you? And everyone would know the answer to that question. And then he would say to people, and who runs Tianjin for you? And they would all look at him like, where, what, where are you talking about? So my husband and I were on a train, and we were traveling from Beijing to Shanghai. And you know, we're on one of those fancy high-speed trains. And we passed the city. And the city was a major city. And, and we're 45 minutes outside of Beijing maximum. And my husband says to me, where is that? So I like, start looking on Google Maps to figure out where the heck is that. It was Tianjin. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is there are many places all over China that we all need to know. Yeah. And, and this audience may or may not know them, but it's the world's changing. That's an amazing story. All right, so let's talk about leadership because that's clearly front of mind for this uh, entire audience. You know, one of the coolest things I would imagine about working at McKinsey is you're, uh, you are, to, to quote uh, the, the popular musical Hamilton, you're in the room where it happens all the time. <laughs> I mean, and you are, I would imagine, hearing it pretty uh, sharply yes. <laughs> at times uh, from CEOs, and so you can assess them. What's the secret, I mean, to them being effective? What's the advice you give them? What have you observed that makes them really good at their jobs? Yeah, so I mean, I think there's, there's obviously a lot of different answers you can give to that, and, I, and we can talk through different dimensions. One of the things that I think relates most to just this whole topic of what's happening in the world today just is a sense of a learning mindset. So, you know, one of the major pitfalls I see people is they don't acknowledge what their strengths are and what their weaknesses are. They don't acknowledge their own biases. And so that can be, and you know, all of you, every single person in this room has biases. So that can be, I am more comfortable with a certain business model. That can be I'm more comfortable with a certain geography of the world. That can be I'm more comfortable with a, a certain person in the room. But just recognizing that the nature of change requires you to learn and requires you to know what you don't know and have the humility to ask if you don't know. I was, uh, my first day on the job at McKinsey, which was more than 25 years ago, I was uh, you know, in a training room and somebody was describing what we were gonna have to do and, so, and I just couldn't help myself, so I raised my hand. And I was like, you know, do you expect that I already know how to do Excel? This is like Excel had barely come out. It was like four seconds past Lotus Notes, and and he like you know smiled sweetly. That at was me a, that was what we call a knowing chuckle in the room. <laughs> exactly. Gosh. So he smiled sweetly at me, and I uh, was like, oh, that's no problem. We'll teach you. And then I'm convinced that he turned to the person who does our professional development, the person who assigns new people to projects and said, okay, don't put me with her. <laughs> but, but in any case, I think that, you know, that strength of both knowing what you do and don't know and actually just not, not being afraid to say, hey, I don't know that. I need to learn that now. And that certainly applies to all of the evolution in technology, but it applies to many other things as well. Do you feel like people are getting more or less comfortable saying that? I that they don't know things? I think it's a mix. I mean, I, I hope it's more, but there's certainly, I meet a lot of people who take themselves too seriously. What? And, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I try to take it down a notch whenever I can. Um, all right, so what else do you see? Because you've also, I mean, I was going through your, your history a little bit. I mean, you've worked with some really interesting uh, companies. And when we think about this idea of, I, I want to make sure we get to this, this the purpose-driven uh, company, you know, as we think about the various challenges that, that people have. Uh, you know, you and I were talking backstage a little bit about, you know, Tom's a, is an example that I think I feel like everybody knows, but that's really caught on in, in a lot of ways. This idea, and and when we hire people, as as we all do, it feels like they are looking for something a little little more meaningful. 
Is that a real thing, or is that yeah, just so something it's, we it's, tell ourselves that millennials want? Well, definitely millennials want it, and it's absolutely a real thing. I mean, you know, most of the companies we work with are either have already or are going through some process to reflect on what they think their purpose should be. That's absolutely happening. I think it does matter quite a lot whether it's authentic or not. You know, it has to be authentic to the leader. It has to be authentic to the organization. You do read some purpose statements, and they just come across quite flat. And you read other purpose statements, and you know that they're immediately inspiring. So one of the ones that I was mentioning, you know, Walt Disney's is it's literally to make people happy. I mean, what could be better than that? It's like I want to make people happy. So you think you're, you know, you're somebody who works in one of their parks, or you're somebody who works in the accounting department. If you say that's in the context of a shared mission that we are going to be, what we're going to be here to do is to make people happy. It, 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 it without question brings new meaning to, to what you do. And I, you know, one of the companies that um, I've had a fair amount of exposure to uh, is in. Uh, the healthcare industry, and every single one of those employees knows that what they do each day is they actually make people's lives better, and and it it permeates the entire culture. So McKinsey, not surprisingly, has a fancy math way of assessing a company's effectiveness. We call it an organizational health index. So it's a whole series of measures that look at you know. Is the organization aligned in terms of where it's going? Is the organization high performing in terms of execution? Does the organization have a mechanism of renewal? And what you find is an organization that has a very clear sense of purpose that comes through in all kinds of ways. Hmm. It doesn't just come through in the sense that people are happier. It comes through in that the fact that they actually are more effective in what they do. So what's the secret to, I was about to say, what's the secret to authenticity? But that doesn't really sound right. Um, <laughs> make me more authentic, Liz. Um, but are there sort of secrets that you tell CEOs to convey their authenticity, I guess, and to convey the purpose? Because I think one of the things you're alluding to is you can write it down on a sheet of paper and you can post it on the, you know, canteen wall, but people may not buy it if, if folks aren't living it. So, so what do you do? I, I think it, you know, it, it has to speak to the CEO's heart. That it has to come from them. It has to come from something in their past, in their history, in something maybe. Sometimes it's because they're particularly enamored of a certain technology in the company or of a certain R and D capability in the company. But when you when you're working with someone who really believes, they really believe that what they are doing is in some way going to make the world a better place. And that can have all kinds of meanings. That can be because we're going to make food costs less expensive. That be, that's because we're going to have a breakthrough around. Uh, you know, a, a new payments technology. It really can be anything, but that sense of I'm going to make a difference and, every, and I can make any employee in this organization want to be a part of that journey with me. Yeah. So as you can imagine, for us, we have to figure out how to create a sense of purpose for people across a wide range of industries, I mean, for people in completely different cultural contexts. So that's, that's part of the adventure that we're on. Well, and part of what I think you're doing, and, and you've written and talked about this before yourself, is this idea of building a team. Um, you know, there's been much written and, and cited. Doris Kearns Goodwin, you know, famously wrote Team of Rivals. You talk more about an unrivaled team. Mm -hmm. So help us understand uh, what that is. I was sure, intrigued by sure. that. So, so um, I took on this role leading uh, McKinsey in North America uh, just about a year ago. And it's 9,000 people, it's 850 partners. We have no, th there's no organization structure. It, it isn't how we operate. We're, we are what's called a self-governing partnership. So partners have independence to do whatever they feel like doing. So leading in that context is a fascinating challenge. <laughs> <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? That's an, an... And, it, 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 and, and I'm guessing it's You just people, tell people to do things. Yeah, they're, they're exactly. not opinionated. Exactly. You know, they they just, have no ideas of their own. Yeah. So, so one of the things that you do is you try to lead through ideas. And you see whether the idea is captivating enough that it actually mobilizes people to innovate beyond those ideas. And so two of the ideas that have been near and dear to my heart, one is this idea that I believe that we as a firm should move from being insight partners, the person that you call when you have a question and you're looking for you know, a fat blue book document to tell you the answer to the question, to what I refer to as impact partners, the person who's actually going to make your company more successful, more market share, greater, greater growth, build a capability. So this is theme one, is from insight partner to impact partner. That has completely changed our hiring philosophy. It makes every single person think differently about how they talk to a client about what they can do. So that was theme number one. How does it change your hiring philosophy? That's interesting. 
Well, basically what it means is that it's not good enough to hire some just have some MBAs. Uh, you know, if you actually want to make something happen in an organization, you know, you might need some designers, you might need some data scientists, right. you might need people that actually know how to rally an organization to achieve something together. So we've completely diversified who we've hired as a result huh. uh, of that philosophy. But so the second theme is this idea of unrivaled teams. And so what I've tried to get across uh, with that thought is that for any executive who has a very ambitious uh, goal that they're trying to achieve, they can work with a lot of different partners. And lots of different partners have a lot of different content capability. The question is, can we truly build an unrivaled team with them? And can I bring a diverse team that collaborates together in a truly unrivaled way? And so when you get into that and say, well, how do we do that? One of the things that I realized is that if each member of that team is not healthy and is not in a great frame of mind themselves, there's no way you can create a great team together. Like, and you can't burn through it. I'm going to be a great team you know, just for the next seven days, and then you know, we're all going to flame out for the next few months afterwards. So one of the things that I've, I've really emphasized is this idea that, it, that it's time to take care of ourselves. So for me, that means sleep. I am one of those people that is absolutely religious about eight hours of sleep each night. It means exercise. It means a few moments. Uh, I describe it to my husband as a restorative break because there are times where I just need a restorative break. And that might be some silly television show. It might be a book. My son has happily adopted the concept of the restorative break. So sometimes <laughs> homework, not so much. But I think this idea, you bring a diverse group of people together, every individual person needs to feel that they can bring their, them, their best self into the team which means that they feel rested. So I think one of the obligations when you, as a leader, is say, am I creating that context? And certainly having a sense of purpose gives people that sense of renewal and energy, and they can push through tough times, but they also have to have some form of recovery. And if they have that opportunity for recovery, and then we can create an environment where no matter whether your perspective is from all different kinds of places, you all feel welcome to, to bring your best self to work, now we're gonna really accomplish something together. So is it safe to, first of all, Carol, I should point out, that she, when she said silly television show, she looked at me. So I don't know what that means about <laughs> what we're doing every day. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I thought maybe she was talking about our show. <laughs> no? Okay, all right, good, all right. Um, but is it safe to say that this room can go home and say, I talked to a very senior McKinsey consultant and she said, I need to get more sleep? Yes. Is that okay? Yes. All right, so we can do that. And no, but can just really, I'm, I'm like absolutely no, I am, religious I am on this topic. I am with you, yeah. And so, but part of the reason why is, and I'm sure this is true for all of you, if you say work requires a tremendous amount of creativity, work requires a tremendous amount of emotional resilience, there's often a lot of conflict at work. And people come from very different perspectives, things can get heated, things, people can get upset. Any time somebody's in my office either yelling or crying, which happens with some amount of frequency, clients as well, yeah. but I get both. Yeah. My first question is, how much sleep did you get last night? <laughs> because I, or, or are you hungry? Some people <laughs> need to eat. No, those are the two choices. And once we've got those two things worked out, then we can move on to whatever the topic is at hand. I, I mean, I have so many other questions, but <laughs> I, I don't know if I can't, and I, I don't know where to go from here. But um, we only have about a minute left. And first of all, thank you. That was amazing. And second of all, like you do seem very optimistic about the world at a time when I feel like there's not a huge amount of optimism around. Why? So I, I feel like, you know, I'm lucky. I feel like I, every single day I get to work with people who achieve amazing things. And, you know, in, the, in most instances, and I'm sure you all are just like this, the CEO will make some completely unreasonable request. You know, we're going to like triple profits in four seconds. We're going to launch a new product in two days. I mean, whatever it is, it seems completely unreasonable to the, to the team at the time. And yet, there's a way to get there, or there's a way to get much, much further than would have been gotten if, if it hadn't been tried. And so if you, just, if you just have the belief that in every single person is the possibility to reach a bit further in terms of their potential, and that in any given team, they together can achieve something that nobody thought was possible, and that's what I do every day. Yeah. So it makes you an optimistic person. Yeah. <laughs> Liz, thank you so much. What a great way to kick off the dinner and the conference. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you.